Good afternoon. The next, good afternoon. The next item of business is portfolio questions. First question, Claudia Beamish, please. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to move freight off roads onto rail in light of it declaring a climate emergency. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matthews. Our approach to supporting rail freight is outlined in our rail freight strategy, strengthened by new network rail targets to grow rail freight and backed by past and current investment, including a new £25 million control period six Scottish Strategic Rail Freight Fund and our mode shift grant system. In addition, our draft national transport strategy, which will set out the future direction of transport, reflects the declaration of the global climate emergency with climate change action identified as a priority. It will also reiterate the role of transport in helping to deliver the 20 45 net zero target. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, however, in the Eclair Committee evidence at stage two of the Climate Change Bill, the Freight Transport Association stated, at best we could get to 5% of freight off trucks and onto rail. This is very concerning. And the Scottish Government does indeed fund a great deal more road projects than, than rail, further marginalising rail freight. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that balanced funding is required for better targeting of small freight facilities grants, longer rail over, um, overtaking loops, restoration of double track, diversionary tracks, gauge clearance and electrification, to name a few. Well, that's quite a lot, but never mind, uh, Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, so we uh, undertake a considerable amount of work, as I've just outlined, in order to encourage freight. However, I don't know if it's now official Labour Party policy to cut the roads budget uh, in order to transfer that into rail instead. However, over the course of the, and I suspect in some of the later questions, people will be asking me for making more investment into roads as well. So the £25 million, which I announced a few weeks ago, is a key part of helping to support the industry to move, to make the modal shift from road into rail freight in order to assist that. And we'll continue to work with them in achieving that. We've also set out very ambitious targets for network rail to make sure that they're driving this forward in a way that sees more uh, going into rail freight and we'll continue to do everything we can to encourage commercial businesses to make use of the rail freight options which are available to them as we work with the rail freight industry in making sure it's an attractive proposition for businesses to use. Jamie Green briefly. Uh, thanks Deputy Presiding Officer. The uh, current section will be aware that Presswick Airport is very well connected uh, via rail and a huge amount of cargo goes through the airport and inevitably onto the road. Can I ask uh, what the government is doing to look at better utilising uh, that rail capacity and specifically the Falklands Junction, which is an underused section of railway at the moment, which could help pr provide that modal shift that we need? Cabinet Secretary. So the decision it is a commercial decision uh, which they make. We provide funding to help to support them in making that transition. There's a, several key areas where we know there is a possibility of increasing uh, freight, particularly in the area of timber. Uh, and we've been taking forward work with the industry to try and encourage them to do that. My colleague Fergus Ewing chaired a meeting in London with those in the rail freight industry, the Transport Scotland officials, and also within the forestry industry to look at how we can create greater connections in these areas. Uh, but ultimately, it is a commercial decision that is made by companies on choosing to use rail freight rather than road freight. So we try to make it as attractive as possible, but ultimately it will be a commercial decision that companies will make. Question two, Joe McAlpin. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made with the Strategic Transport Projects Review. Cabinet Secretary. The second Strategic Transport Projects Review is progressing on schedule as part of the evidence gathering stage. Transport Scotland has successfully established 11 regional transport working groups. These groups demonstrated the collaborative approach being taken by the review and the, that more than 30 stakeholder workshops have been or will be held across the country. This also follows publication of the Borders Transport Corridor Study on the 5th of March and the South West Scotland Transport Study, which I'm pleased to confirm will be published in draft format by the end of this month. In addition, there will be an opportunity for members of the public to have their input later this year. Joe McAlpine. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and I look forward to, to reading uh, the draft plan for the South West. The SNP manifesto commits the Government to better link Dumfries to Scotland's central belt and the motorway and to improvements in the A75. Can the Cabinet Secretary indicate how this commitment will be reflected in the STPR? Cabinet Secretary. 
So, an officer, as I just mentioned, the South West uh, Scotland Transport Study will be published in draft by the end of this month. Uh, part of the work which they've been undertaking uh, is a detailed assessment of options to link Dumfries uh, to key markets, including to the central belt. The emerging findings from that will then feed into the STPR2 process, and it will, be ensure, will ensure that it's considered alongside all of the other options that are being considered. But I can give an assurance to the member that's one of the areas which is being considered as part of the study. Kenneth Gibson, briefly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the A737 will be included in the Strategic Transport Project Review, given it now takes some 8 million vehicles a year, is becoming increasingly congested and needs significant investment from the Manorhead Roundabout at Beath to the B787 and for the newly opened Dalry Bypass at Tuka Winning? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the recently opened uh, Dalry Bypass, which uh, Kenny Gibson joined me on uh, just the other week, uh, alongside the improvements to the uh, current, that are currently being constructed at the DEN uh, realignment and the design work which is currently being taken forward uh, around improvements on the uh, A737 at Beath are all key commitments for the Scottish Government in order to make sure that we invest in the A737 uh, in order to support the North Ayrshire uh, economy and North Ayrshire communities. I can also reassure the member that the A737 uh, forms part of the Trunk Road network and it will be included within our consideration for the Strategic Transport Projects Review too. Question three, James Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve the level of rail services, uh, ScotRail services in the Glasgow area. Cabinet Secretary. Further to the answer I provided to the member at the Chamber on the 9th of May, more than nine out of ten trains now run on time. Within the Glasgow area, the Donovan recommendations for a right time departure at Mulgai from December 2018 timetable has seen a PPM improvement across the wider Strathclyde Electrics network during the peak. Period 9 before the new December timetable saw PPM at 73.3% and the latest period 2 PPM is now at 89.9%, a clear marked improvement. However, there is more work to be done. An ongoing delivery of the recommendations from Donovan and the remedial plan will support further improvements within the Glasgow area. James Kelly. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. However, the answer he's given doesn't stack up with the experience of passengers in the Rutherglen area, where 43% of trains, according to the latest statistics, are not turning up in time. Cabinet Secretary, this is simply not good enough. Uh, that people have been let down by the ScotRail services. And can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, therefore, if he will apologise to passengers for the appalling level of service and agree that it's time to call time on the Abellio contract, terminate it, and introduce a contract process that puts it into public hands. Thank you. Hands. Cabinet Secretary. Subsign officer, the figures which I gave him are factual information in terms of PPM, which is recorded, which is standard right across the industry. But alongside that, the member will also understand that some 60% of all delays and cancellations that we have in the network are as a result of infrastructure failures, which are the responsibility of Network Rail, which we believe should be accountable and responsible to this parliament rather than to the UK parliament, so we can address these issues much more effectively. That's some of the key work that's been taken forward around the Donovan Review in order to do so. But what the member can be assured of is that we'll continue to do everything we can to improve services, including on the Rutherglen line, and to make sure that Network Rail are taking forward the measures that are necessary so we get greater reliability on our network. And I do hope, I do hope that the Labour Party will get behind us and call for the devolution of network rail to this parliament while the Williams Review is considering the matter in order to deal with these issues much more effectively here in this parliament. Adam Tompkins, briefly, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister not agree that one thing that would certainly improve ScotRail services in Glasgow is a rail link to the airport? Can you explain why the SNP have cancelled this project again? Cabinet Secretary. I'm sure the member was here during the course of my statement on this matter and what I said on that occasion still stands. Question four, John Scott. To presenting officer to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to improve the road network in South Ayrshire. Cabinet Secretary. This Government recognises the importance of the trunk road network in South Ayrshire. Since 2007-08, this Government has invested over £66 million in the maintenance of the A77 and a further £44 million in the maintenance of the A78. 
In addition to the above maintenance improvements, work, are, work is underway on site as part of the £29 million construction contract for the much needed A77 Mabel Bypass. This project will generate significant benefits for local communities and for those travelling from further afield to our, uh, to our key ports and beyond. The new bypass, which is expected to open in summer 2021, will separate local and strategic traffic, relieving congestion in the town and improving safety and journey time reliability on the A77. John Scott. Uh, many thanks. Uh, a, decade, a decade ago, plans were considered as part of the Scottish Government's Strategic Transport Projects Review to upgrade the A77 around air from single to dual carriageway and grade separate the Dutch House, Whitlets and Holmes and Roundabouts. It was forecast that these improvements would cut levels of congestion and could result in an accident rate reduction re uh, up to 50%. With no action having been taken on these proposals, over the last decade. Will the Minister commit to taking them forward now? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Mr. Officer, I'm more than happy to give consideration to these issues, but as a member will know, we are now into the process of STPR2, and projects which have not been taken forward within that particular programme will be considered as part of STPR2 as well. So there's an opportunity for us to consider that as part of the wider work that's been undertaken under the review process at the present time. Question five, Neil Bibby to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve services for East Renfrewshire train passengers using the East Cobride line. Cabinet Secretary. From this May, ScotRail now provides 1,000 extra seats daily on East Cobride services, benefiting passengers at Busbay, Clarkston, Giffnock and Thornley Bank. However, existing infrastructure constraints that constrains the length, speed and frequency of trains. So we have allocated up to £24.8 million to ScotRail to develop designs for more capacity and carbon-free journeys. This development over approximately 18 months will identify the right long-term solution, including the option for electrification. Work will focus on providing enhanced connectivity, improved accessibility to stations, better transport integration with improved park and ride facilities and active travel provision. Neil Bibby. I recently met with Scott Rail and passengers at Thornley Bank Station to discuss issues like overcrowding on the East Kilbride Line. A number of passengers asked about the Scottish Government's long-term plans for investment in the rail line. Further to the announcement of £25 million is to be made available for enhancements, can the Minister explain what exactly those enhancements will be? And specifically, can he clarify whether the Scottish Government is fully committed to the electrification and enhancement proposals for the East Kilbride Line set out in Network Rail's route study? Cabinet Secretary. So, President Officer, the uh, work which we have now commissioned Network Rail to undertake on the East Coal Bride Line is to consider issues such as double tracking, extending the length of the platforms, the electrification, improvement to stations, uh, in order to make sure we can provide greater capacity on that particular line. But remember, we'll also recall that was one of the key lines which would have been affected had we gone ahead with the Glasgow Airport Rail Line, because it would have reduced capacity uh, to extend on the East Coal Bride Line. And one of the issues which I highlighted was the potential negative impact it would have on extending and increasing capacity on the East Coal Bride Line. No doubt that slipped the member's mind when he was calling for Garrow at that particular point. And this is why we need to make sure we take a balanced approach so that the investments we are making in rail this and this coming five-year period will be some £4.8 billion to make sure we get the infrastructure right, not only for people in Renfrewshire and Glasgow, but also in East Coal Bride as well. Tom Arthur, briefly. Yeah, I was constituents who live in East Renfrewshire, can the Cabinet Secretary update Parliament on what action has been taken to improve capacity in both the Nielsen line and the Barhead line? And does he agree that electrification of the Barhead line is an important future objective? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President officer, since May, 3,000 extra seats have been made available on the Barhead services, and there's now more longer four and six carriage electric trains on the Nielsen service. In developing our current pipeline of projects, we are fully committed to considering capacity increases on the rail network, together with electrification and other sustainable rolling stock options. Uh, the need to provide decarbonised transport is a key priority for the government in taking forward its climate change challenge. Both the Neilston and Barhead lines will be considered for further improvements alongside the other competing interests on our rail network. Question six, Sandra White. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives of First Group. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Scottish Government officials last met with representatives of First Group on the 4th of June. 
Sandra White. The Cabinet Secretary will aware of the significant plans by First Group, which include pursuing strategic options through the sale of or other means to separate First Bus from First Group. Can I therefore ask the Minister what input the Scottish Government will have to these plans? After all, in my constituents throughout Scotland, First Bus is the first port of call, if you may say. Cabinet Secretary. General Officer, we have been provided by reassurance uh, from First Bus that services and existing investment plans will continue as normal while the future of the bus business is decided. Uh, First Bus has undertaken to keep us informed of any developments and have said that they will work with their employees and uh, the unions to explain their plans and their implications. I can assure the member that we will continue to engage with First Bus around this matter until they reach a point where they have clarity on what their future plans are and to continue to impress on them the importance of continuing with services at the present time. Briefly, Lewis MacDonald. The Cabinet Secretary agree that the sale of First Bus offers an ideal opportunity for councils which want to run their own bus services, like Aberdeen City Council, and will the Government support that? Cabinet Secretary. It does, uh, sign Officer, and the amendment which was passed in the uh, committee today, which is Amendment 68 to create the Lothian Bus Scheme, which was supported by the Labour Party, is one which I welcome, which will allow them to be able to do so. Question 7, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government action it's taking to improve safety on the A77. Cabinet Secretary. We are committed to improving safety on our trunk road, including the A77. Uh, we have invested over £66 million on the A77 since 2007 to ensure its safe and efficient operation. Our annual assessment of trunk road safety performance has identified the A751 junction between Holston and Sandyford Toll roundabouts for further investigation this financial year. We have delivered passive safety chevrons at the Moncton Head roundabout, safety speed management measures south of Air to Ballantrae, and are progressing a speed limit reduction of 40 miles per hour on this location. We are completing road safety investigation works uh, on the Moncton Head Dutch House roundabout section at the present time. Brian Whittle. Yeah, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and can also say I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary taking the time to meet my constituent Colin Price and I to discuss his campaign to close the gap in safety camera coverage on the A77 following the death of his wife to a collision with a boy racer. However, given the fact that much of the 32 mile safety camera stretch of the A77 was judged by the same criteria as this two mile gap uh, um, and has similar measurement against that criteria, isn't it time that common sense prevailed and that gap was filled in? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, I uh, recognise the work that Mr. Whittle has undertaken along with Mr. Price um, through the, uh, following the tragic death of his wife on this particular section of the road. And as I gave an undertaking to uh, Mr. Price at the time when I met with him, is that we would undertake a further uh, speed safety audit uh, on that particular section of the road, and we would also consider the revised criteria uh, for the installation of uh, safety cameras. He'd be aware that the outcome of that has indicated it does not meet that national criteria. However, what we have sought to do is to consider whether there are further measures that can be introduced in the area, including working with Police Scotland, who we know are undertaking targeted enforcement action uh, within this particular route. But I can assure the member that when we do consider these issues, applying the national criteria is one of the important elements that needs to be taken into account in determining whether the safety cameras being deployed in a particular area will maximise the potential benefits that will come from them. Uh, and that's the approach which is taken for all of the uh, average speed camera systems which are uh, installed across the trunk road network and will continue to be the case going forward. But we will always consider whether there are individual cases, whether there are measures that we can further introduce to address issues on particular sections of the road, and that will remain the case in this instance. However, as the national criteria has been applied to it following the further survey, it does not meet the criteria for further uh, speed, average speed cameras to be installed. Uh, briefly, question eight, Keith Brown. To ask the Scottish Government, how many people have used the Alawa Stirling Rail Service since it opened in 2008? Equally briefly, Cabinet Secretary, please. The total number of passengers travelling between Alawa and Stirling since its opening is estimated to be 4,194,574 up until the 31st of March 2019. Passengers using the route can now benefit from Scottish Government's significant investment in electrification of the line. This has enabled the introduction of new electric rolling stock and the recent timetable change delivered 4,000 additional weekday seats for passengers using the Edinburgh-Glasgow, Stirling, Alloa, Dunblane routes. Keith Brown. 
thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply, and I'm sure he'll agree with me that the success of the service has surpassed all expectations, but can he confirm in light of the interest from Talgo in the Long Annet site, if any discussions have taken place about extending the passenger service from Alloa eastwards? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, there's no doubt this line has been extremely successful and has surpassed expectations. Uh, as the member will be aware, we have been directly engaged with Talgo on their potential development at the Longanet site. Uh, and since they made their announcement that the Longanet site was their preferred option, we've been working with them around uh, the development of a factory at that site, which could create up to a thousand jobs. One of the options which I have asked Transport Scotland and Network Rail to consider is how we can maximise the rail connectivity to this site, which includes the option of actually extending uh, the existing passenger route east of Alloa and to look at electrification of that line uh, further to the Longanet site and potentially beyond into Dunfermline, if that proved to be appropriate. Thank you. That concludes questions on transport. Move on to the next set of portfolio questions, Justice and Law Officers. Um, Whenever you settle, Mr. Corrie, we await with bated breath. Question one, Maurice Corrie, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that Police Scotland is accessing the necessary skills and resources to keep our communities safe. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Yusuf. Recorded crime has fallen by 42% since 2006 7. Uh, non sexual crimes of violence have fall, fall, fallen by 49%. Uh, the recruitment, training, and deployment of police officers is, of course, a matter for the Chief Constable, the Police Officer Quarterly Strength data as of 31st of March this year showed there were 17,251 police officers in Scotland. That's an increase of over 1,000 police officers from the position that we inherited uh, in 2007. This obviously contrasts uh, with a decrease of almost 20,000 in the same time period uh, in England and Wales. Uh, all police officers and staff are highly trained uh, through their dedicated service day in and day out to keep all of our communities safe. It's a responsibility, obviously, of the SPA to allocate resources to Police Scotland. The Scottish Government is protecting the police resource budget in real terms. And of course, we have also uh, given an uplift in the capital budget by 52%. Maurice Corrie. Uh, I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. We know that the number of special constables in Scotland has more than halved since the creation of Police Scotland. These officers have been described by Police Scotland as vital, undertaking high visibility work like patrolling, being a seconded to specialist teams like road policing and CID. And I've been saying for a long time in this chamber that there is more to be done to exploit the valuable experience of our armed forces veterans and providing better routes for them into policing. Will the Cabinet Secretary recognise the enormous capacity that our communities have lost since 2013? And will he commit to looking at this issue in more detail? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say to, to Maurice Colley, while I don't disagree with the general thrust of this question, which is uh, the valuable work that special constables do, I know this from a personal point of view. My cousin uh, is a police officer uh, at the moment with Police Scotland, but started uh, his police career as a special constable. Uh, so I know the value that special constables uh, absolutely play from a personal point of view as well, very much a, a professional uh, point of view. But you will forgive me, uh, it is really important that I restate that these matters are operational for the Chief Constable. Uh, and so it would be more appropriate for Maurice Collier to take these issues up with Police Scotland directly. Uh, if he wishes after this uh, session, of course, I will write to him with the contact details of the person most appropriate. Uh, but not to take away from the general tenor of his question, uh, I absolutely value uh, the work that uh, special constables do as part of the police family. Fulton McGregor, briefly. President officer, thanks to pressure from this Scottish Government, Police Scotland will now benefit from being able to claim VAT of around £25 million a year previously paid to the UK Government. Will the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the Scottish Government will continue to press the UK Government for a refund of the £125 million paid by Police Scotland in VAT between 2013 and 2018? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, was, of course, uh, SNP Scottish Government-led pressure that, uh, of course, got the UK Government to see uh, that they were treating and, and to understand they were treating uh, Scottish forces uh, unfavourably and unfairly in comparison to forces uh, in England uh, and Wales. Having conceded the argument, they've not actually put the money uh, necessarily where their mouth is, with £125 million pounds still to, to be refunded uh, that would be taken away in VAT to Police Scotland. Uh, and also, of course, 50 million uh, paid by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service uh, as well. So every time a Conservative does talk to me about increasing the budget for police calling, it would be nice if they actually uh, wrote to the Treasury and asked for our money back. Yeah. Question two is not lodged. Question three, Bob Doris. Uh, 
to Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how it is working with the SPS to review the prison estate in Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government and Scottish Prison Service are committed to modernising and improving our prison estate. The current priorities are development of the new female uh, estate, a replacement for HMP Barlini uh, and then HMP Highland. Uh, the Scottish Government has allocated funds to the Scottish Prison Service to allow them to begin the site acquisition process for a replacement of HMP Barlini. Uh, site searches began in 2014. A suitable site has been identified in Proven Mill. Uh, the planning process has begun uh, and the first public information event was held last week on Wednesday, uh, the 5th of June. Bob Doris. Cabinet Secretary, a second pre-consultation event will take place on the 3rd of July for the proposed HMP Berlin replacement with a view for planning permission in principle to lodge by the end of the month and a final decision by Christmas. A tight process for such a major development. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the SPS must continue to engage extensively with local communities such as Jermison and my constituency throughout that period and given that this site has in part been selected due to its transportation hub potential, that the SPS, Glasgow City Council and others indeed must actively look at better public transport links for Jernison and the Royston Corridor more generally, irrespective of whether planning permission is granted. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think there's a really important point raised uh, by, by Bob Doris. I know he's had uh, conversations with the uh, Scottish Prison Service already uh, on this issue. I know he'll continue to engage uh, as the process uh, moves on, but he's absolutely right. Uh, transport links are vital for any prison. We know that that family contact, um, that contact to services uh, is hugely important when it comes to potential rehabilitation uh, of prisoners. So he's, he's absolutely right uh, around, around that. Um, as well as uh, the, the, the usual planning uh, process, the member will probably be aware, uh, as with any planning application, it's anticipated uh, that there would be a travel plan uh, as well as a traffic impact analysis that will form part uh, of that application. So uh, that, that will be a part of the conversation uh, as we progress. So uh, yes, I, I, I do believe uh, that, that that issue should be looked at, uh, particularly important and vital uh, for any prison, but particularly I would say for a prison uh, that will be the size of, of the replacement HMP uh, Barlini. Polly McNeil briefly. I'd like to welcome the replacement of Burnley Prison long overdue. Uh, recently it was operating at 140 per cent capacity. This is a regular occurrence. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary, first of all, could inform Parliament whether or not the new build will solve to in the main the problem of capacity and whether he's able to tell me now or later uh, the extent of double bunking in Berlin Prison. Cabinet Secretary. I can thank Polly McNeil for a very important question. I don't think I've had the chance to uh, welcome her to the, the, the uh, justice questions, or indeed, uh, I don't know if she's permanently in, in that position, but I know certainly I know she's taking over uh, until uh, the, the, the recess begins. So uh, can I welcome her interest in all matters uh, justice related? I know she's had a long standing interest in. In terms of the, the, the question, which is a hugely important one, we're not planning. Uh, to build a, a replacement for Berlini that is sometimes quoted in the press as a super jail. That, that would be the wrong thing for us to do. Uh, building our way, we can't build our way out of the prison population uh, problem uh, that, that, that we have. There's a whole raft of reasons why that prison population is as high as it is. One of the factors undoubtedly has been some of the changes in home detention curfew made uh, on the back of the, the two important reviews that took place after that tragic murder of, of Craig uh, McClellan, but the numbers have been very drastic. Um, so we have to tackle uh, all of the various different factors uh, around why that prison population is so, so high. So forgive me, I don't have the, the number in terms of double bunking in front of me. I'll, I'll, I'll endeavour to get it to her, but uh, I say this as I did say yesterday in front of the Justice Committee, the high prison population and the fact that its trajectory is increasing, the fact that we have the highest imprisonment rate uh, in Western Europe, uh, the third highest uh, correctional uh, rate uh, as well, uh, is frankly staining our conscience and very much uh, goes against uh, the very progressive country we are and we want to be. So I'd be happy to, to furnish Polly McNeil with details of the exact figure she wishes and if she would like a more detailed conversation around how to reduce that prison population, uh, then I'd be delighted to have that conversation. Can I just gently say it was a, a good answer, but a long answer, and I'd like shorter answers so everybody gets chipped in. Question four, Bruce Crawford, please. To ask the Scottish Government how many projects have been funded by the Cash Back for Communities programme in Stirling since 2008. Cabinet Secretary. Between 2008 and 2018, the Cash Back for Communities programme has invested over 1.5 million in the Stirling area, delivering over 62,000 activities to support young people 
into positive destinations. Bruce Crawford. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and very much welcome the scheme which reinvests criminal assets back into communities. Can I ask how the Scottish Government will ensure the next stage of the cash back programme will focus on projects that support young people and communities most affected by crime? And that was pretty short. I was about to compliment you, but you, you really ruined it for yourself now. <laughs> There's no point complimenting yourself, it undercuts it. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm never one to compliment myself, uh, presiding officer. I'll leave that to other people. Uh, to, to. Um, Bruce Crawford touches upon a really important point, particularly the last point in his question. I think it's hugely important. I've had very good discussions with those uh, partners that are involved in cashback. Uh, that have operated in, in, in our communities and often in, in some of the most deprived communities because it's absolutely essential that every phase of cashback we improve upon uh, the last phase. And uh, we will be targeting, when it comes to phase five of cashback, targeting that money uh, back into the communities uh, that are being so blighted by, by serious and organised uh, mm -hmm. crime. So uh, details of that um, uh, programme uh, will, will be available. I'll be delighted to share that with Bruce Crawford. Question five, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to provide facilities for female prisoners in the Highlands in light of the plans for the new Inverness prison being shelved until 2023. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, in June 2015, my predecessor announced ambitious plans for the future of the female custodial estate. Uh, these plans include a new 80-place national facility to be built in Cotton Vale and up to five new community-based custodial units, each accommodating around about 20 women at locations across Scotland. Uh, the first two community-based custodial units will be located in Glasgow and Dundee. SPS is working towards a timescale of opening the first CCUs by December 2020 and the national facility by summer 2021. The custodial arrangements for women from the north of Scotland will remain as they are at present. Uh, this means that whenever possible, women sentenced or remanded by a court in the north of Scotland will be located with an HMP and YOI uh, Grampian, which offers a range of interventions and services specifically designed for women. Um, I th thank the, the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but is he aware of the incredibly long distances that people, families from the Highlands and Islands have to travel to visit people located in Aberdeen and quite often in Glasgow as well, hundreds of miles away from home, and that has a huge impact on children and the wider family. Um, around this time last year, the Inspector for Prisons in Scotland, David Strang, called for more suitable accommodation for female inmates. And I believe that a community custody unit could be built at the new site for the Inverness prison, or indeed sooner at another site in Inverness. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, will he make female accommodation in Inverness a priority? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say to, to, to Rora Grant, she should continue to have those conversations with SPS. I've mentioned that the first two com community custody units have been uh, decided upon and are progressing well in Glasgow and Dundee. That does leave another three locations. I, I won't determine what those locations uh, are, particularly because we want to wait to see the evidence from the first two uh, and, and how they operate uh, and, and, and where the, the next three can be located. So I would ask Rhoda Grant to continue to have those conversations. It's a difficult issue. It's fair to say that the numbers are very, very low in terms of those coming from Inverness and, 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 and the north. Uh, of, of, of Scotland, uh, around about 13 actually at last count. Uh, and of those 13, the, the women are at different stages in their, in, in their journey uh, along imprisonment. So, uh, you know, it is not as simple as building a, a CCU, which is for women on a, in a particular point in their journey. Uh, so th there are complexities to this, which I know Rhoda Grant will, will appreciate, but I'd suggest to her that she continues to have the conversations with SPS uh, around the CCUs. Uh, and in the meantime, what we'll do is continue to invest in technology, which of course uh, I'd appreciate is not a, a replacement for those direct okay. contact visits, okay. but can certainly help to bring families closer and help uh, offenders uh, on, on, on their uh, rehabilitation journey. Uh, yes, now has, people have to be brief from now on, please. Very briefly, Liam MacArthur, followed by Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> You're on your feet too soon. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> Mr MacArthur. Everybody wants to be Liam MacArthur. In January, the Cabinet Secretary uh, told me that two of the five community custody units be completed uh, by 2020, but the other three would be, quote, dependent on a number of factors. While he can't perhaps uh, confirm the location of those other three units, can he at least give Parliament uh, an indication of the timeline uh, for making those decisions? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'd say to, 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 to Lee MacArthur that 
the, the approach we're taking is a very evidence-based approach. So we want to see how the first two community custody units operate, uh, how successful they are, the impact that they're having. And then I think it's only sensible to then use that information to determine where the next ECUs are. Now, where the next ECUs are will also uh, have, have an impact on the timescales because it takes time for planning, acquiring a site, uh, and so on and so forth. So if you've given me, I, I won't um, necessarily nail myself to, to, to an exact uh, timescale other than to say that, as I said in a previous answer, this is a priority uh, for us. Then, and, and associated with that, we want to make sure that we continue to reduce uh, the number of women that are having uh, to go into prison and, and his support for the presumption against short sentences is very welcome uh, and I'm delighted that we're, we're, we're progressing at that particular policy. Edward Mountain now please. Oh, perfect. Um, with over 200 prisoners from the Highlands being accommodated out with the Highlands I'm told that this is bad for their rehabilitation. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, of course, there's a whole host of reasons, a raft of reasons of why people are sent uh, to, to particular prisons. But on the general premise, having people closer to their families and their communities is better for the rehabilitation. I don't argue uh, with that. And I hope he does understand there are some nuances uh, to why we have uh, HMP Highland, uh, the replacement for, for, for Inverness, uh, in the infrastructure plan on where it is. These things are always reviewed depending on, on, on need. And, and HMP Barlini. Uh, after the female custodial units is, is very much uh, where the need is. But I, I don't disagree with what he says about rehabilitation and the closeness to family and community. And I'll endeavour to keep uh, Edward Mountain up to date on progress uh, of, of HMP Highland. Question seven, Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you, Presenting Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government when the Justice Secretary last met the Scottish Recovery Consortium to discuss the provision of addiction recovery services across the prison estate. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I last visited uh, HMB Barlini, where SRC have a recovery cafe on the 31st of October uh, 2018. Uh, the Minister for Public Health, uh, Wellbeing and Sport is due to meet with the Scottish Recovery Consortium uh, next month, on the 10th of July. Uh, this year to discuss the work of that organisation in general, uh, the issue of their work with the Scottish Prison Service to coordinate recovery development within the prison estate will also be discussed at the meeting uh, next month. Adam Tompkins. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. I think the Cabinet Secretary and I agree on the importance of recovery cafes in prison and we corresponded about this earlier this year with regard to the recovery cafe at HMP Barlini which unfortunately has closed down due to a lack of funding. When the Cabinet Secretary wrote to me on the 21st of May about that matter, he said that the Glasgow ADP would be considering a funding bid to reopen the uh, recovery cafe in Barlini. Could he provide Parliament with an update on the, on the status and nature of that bid? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, my, my understanding is that they haven't uh, come to a final decision, that they're still awaiting uh, the, 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 the decision uh, on that. Uh, of course, that is one for the Glasgow ADP to make. He is right. We, we, we do have uh, a shared appreciation for the work that's done, and I think it's worth putting on record the personal endeavour of Natalie McLean, uh, who I know uh, he, he, he has met in driving forward this work. If he forgives me, I'll see if there is an update. Uh, and when a decision is expected from the Glasgow ADP, of course, that is, is not my decision uh, to make. Um, I'm hoping it is successful because I would not want to see recovery cafes um, having to, to close down. I think they do do good work. Um, and, and as I say, I'll try to get an update for the member. Um, and, and then if he wants a further conversation with me after that, then, then of course, my door is open to that. This has to be very brief, Daniel Johnson. Prisoners often struggle to register with the GP, undermining their recovery. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what progress he's making on this issue, in particular in the trial in three local authority areas that's underway? Cabinet Secretary. I'll, I'll write to the member in a bit more detail. We had a very good conversation uh, with uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary for Health, uh, who's looking at this issue. Uh, we think we have uh, some way forward. Uh, th there are some complications, as we discussed at the Justice Committee, I think, uh, on, on, on previous occasion, but we are making progress and I'll write to the member, uh, either myself or the Cabinet Secretary for Health, write to the member uh, to give them an update, but we're certainly progressing uh, the issue. Question eight, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government for, for its response to new analysis detailing the fall in serious violent crime in Scotland over the last decade. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we very much welcome the recent report into the changing characteristics of serious violence in Scotland. Uh, this found that uh, that most uh, of the fall in serious violence over the last decade is due to fewer cases in Glasgow in the west of Scotland, uh, often involving younger males uh, and the use of a weapon. Uh, members will remember that uh, it was not in too distant memory that Glasgow was named the murder capital of Europe. Uh, what we've achieved uh, is now being looked upon as a role model 
attracting interest from London, the UK and the World Economic Forum. Uh, despite this progress, of course, the research highlights there's still much more that we need to do, uh, particularly uh, around repeat victimisation and to tackle violence uh, wherever it persists. Rona McKay, briefly, please. Thank you. That answer. Serious violent, cri violent crime is reduced by 44% in Eastern Bartonshire, the area I represent. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe these figures are more proof that the Scottish Government's evidence-based approach to re justice and rehabilitation is working? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, uh, I absolutely do. And I think we shouldn't uh, move away from that public health approach. It's fair to say that that, that was started by, by the previous administration, carried on very much by the current uh, Scottish Government. Uh, I would hope that uh, whatever uh, the political makeup of this chamber and future parliaments, uh, that we continue to st stick fast to that public health approach. It's the right approach. Uh, clearly, it is working as well. Thank you. That concludes the portfolio questions. We'll be paused to allow for our benches to change before the next item of business.